Hi everyone, I'm Vanessa Puig Williams. I work for the Environmental Defense Fund. I lead our water program in Texas. And as Catherine said, I'm also the board president of the Hill Country Alliance. And I'm also on the board of the Wimberley Valley Watershed Association, which is now the Watershed Association. So I'm really excited to be here and to be talking about groundwater and spring flow with y'all. I love this leadership summit. It always is so inspiring and really just, I come away with so many ideas and just feel even more motivated to work together as a community to protect the hill country. And so we are gonna talk about um, sort of how we can protect springs in Texas. And with me today to do that is uh, Robert Mace, Dr. Robert Mace. He's the executive director of the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment. And Mitchell Sodak, who is general manager of the Central Texas Groundwater Conservation District in Burnett County. And so um, these two gentlemen have been, they think about groundwater and spring flow all the time, which I'm sure many of you do as well, especially this summer. And even now we're still under drought conditions are thinking about it too. And so I had received many calls and emails this summer from landowners and other spring enthusiasts who are concerned about their springs drying up or, or spring-fed segments of the rivers that cross their land that, they, um, that they're just not sure what to do about. Um, and so that was kind of the genesis for this discussion today. Um, we do recognize that there's not really a one-size-fits-all approach, you know, that there's going to be dependent kind of on local conditions and, and local community issues, but um, I do think that there are some common takeaways. And so we're going to, that's what we're going to talk about today, kind of give you a road map, if you will, for what you can take back to your community. But I want to start first by acknowledging the work that the Watershed Association, along with the Hayes Trinity Groundwater Conservation District and other partners like the Meadows Center um, and Hayes County have done to protect spring flow from Jacob's Well. You heard a little bit about that earlier when David Baker was um, honored with the award. Um, but for, for those of you who don't know, Hayes Trinity Groundwater Conservation District created a groundwater management zone around basically the spring shed or recharge area for Jacob's Well and has um, adopted rules that, um, are, that pertain just to that management zone that are designed to um, basically reduce groundwater pumping in the Cow Creek portion of the Middle Trinity Aquifer that sustains those springs. And what I just want you to take away um, from this that years-long endeavor was, was all of the data and science that went into making the understanding of where that spring shed was located possible. It didn't happen overnight. It happened because of a lot of collaboration and partnerships with researchers that were dedicated to that. And it happened because of the community's involvement and support around um, you know, just the, the same value that we want that spring to continue to flow. There is a game plan in place for Jacob's Well. I know, unfortunately, this summer it, it did stop flowing, um, but there is a plan in place. David and, and the district, we know what needs to happen in order for that spring to flow. It's not going to be easy to, to make happen, but we know what needs to happen. But for other springs across the state, that's, that's not the case. There is not a game plan. And so that's what we're going to talk about right now is what is the game plan? If you wake up tomorrow morning and the spring that you, for most of your life, have enjoyed seeing, enjoyed um, you know, soaking in, enjoyed using for whatever needs you have, all of a sudden isn't flowing like it used to be. So Robert, you have done a lot of research on spring flow, and you just recently completed a report looking at um, springs that have gone dry over the last 50 years. So let me, oh, yeah. What button do I press here? There we go. So, so a little background. Um, this was a, a COVID little project. Go. So like Vanessa, I serve on a lot of committees and uh, and, and, and sometimes those committee meetings go on for hours, and let's be truthful, sometimes the content's not always riveting. So I, so I needed something to uh, multitask with. And 
Um, I had been uh, invited to write a, um, along with uh, Ben Hutchins at uh, Texas State, a um, little summary of kind of, of where springs were at in Texas. And so the reference is by Gunnar Brune. How many of y'all are familiar with Gunnar Brune's Springs of Texas? So that wasn't the one I pulled. Um, he actually did a report that covers the entire state for the Water Development Board. And it has a number in there of how many springs went dry. So I pulled that number off and wrote up this little thing and sent it off. And then it, then it occurred to me, you know, that was 50 years ago. And nobody had, had gone in and reassessed all those springs that he looked at back, back in the, those days. That's a more manageable number of springs. Um, Gunnar Bruins Springs of Texas are like that thick, and it's only volume one, and sadly, volume two never got published. And so what we did was we visited, revisited these springs using uh, Google Earth, as well as um, imagery data at the Texas Water Development Board's uh, water well database, which actually has greater resolution than Google Earth, a uh, little, little tip there. And so we could zoom in and actually see if the spring was still flowing or not, in most cases. I did have to go drive around, um, particularly East Texas, because the darn trees got in the way of Google Earth, of seeing flow status, I had to go look at those in person. Um, and then I also had to rely on Maggie, the spring finding pit bull. She actually helped me, a, a, an owner's dog helped me find one of the springs. And so, so this graph up here, and unfortunately it's a little washed out, but, um, but Gunnar Brun's report for Water Development Board, um, after kind of confirming things, showed about um, 40 out of 273 springs having gone dry by 19. 75. So, so about 15%. Um, these, he, he attempted to include all springs larger than one cubic foot per second, um, or larger, and then also on top of that had some uh, smaller springs that were historical. Um, and so when we did our review, again mostly using Google Earth and the Texas Water Development Board, um, we found that uh, more had gone dry. Um, 62 had gone dry, which is about 23% of, uh, of the springs. Not surprising, you know, we went in, being a scientist, you have a hypothesis, our hypothesis was more springs went dry, you, know, you, you don't win a Nobel Prize for a hypothesis like that, but um, we were able, able to quantify it. It does show where springs have gone dry, and so, and this is showing both the ones from Gunnar Brun as well as, as our study, and there's a lot in uh, West Texas and Far West Texas. Um, for the most part, the hill country has done okay with the springs listed in here. I should also note that, that the definition of spring going dry is it goes dry and it doesn't come back. So, so Jacob's well has gone dry, it does come back, so we would still consider that for this study um, as still flowing. Um, but we also noticed, kind of looking at Gunnar Brun's information, that you know, springs in 75 are flowing strong, and we can see in Google Earth with different coverages that the spring was starting to fail. You'd see um, ephemeral flows in those springs. So, um, and it also seemed like kind of looking at the hill country that, um, again, the ones that are in that report that are going dry are kind of more towards where the Edwards Plateau is kind of flat and starting to get eroded by the rivers out at the edge. So, um, so that's, that's the results there. You know, we are seeing um, more springs going dry over time. I think part of that's due to increased pumping, um, but uh, there may also be a climatic signal. There were springs going dry, particularly in West Texas, that there just wasn't a whole lot around those springs happening, um, which made me wonder if maybe hotter, drier conditions are also affecting those springs. Well, it's an uphill battle, but <laughs> we're going to figure out a way to... Um to make some difference here. And groundwater conservation districts play a, an important role in that. And when we met to talk about this question of what a landowner can do or what you know a community member can do who's concerned about their spring going dry, um, we all agreed that the very first thing, um, let me advance this, that, uh, that you should do is engage with your local groundwater conservation district. So Mitchell, uh, you run a groundwater conservation district. Can you tell us just a little bit about what you know, you're know you charged with doing and why it's imp important to engage with a groundwater district? Absolutely. This on? Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, first of all, you don't want to wait until the title of our talk when the springs go dry. You want to <laughs> ideally start earlier than that. But uh, 
Engagement is always a positive thing, I think, with the groundwater conservation districts. Um, because the, the springs may or may not be known to the district. Uh, a lot of these springs that are mapped are the larger springs. Uh, so springs across the hill country vary greatly in magnitude, uh, many different sizes of springs. Uh, but what I found is to the individual landowner, those springs are all important. The magnitude doesn't vary. They're, they're equally important, whether they're small ones or large ones. So um, having that engagement with the district starts at that level with the staff and uh, identifying what data may already exist. There may be some, some old data that was collected that, that serves as a good baseline for maybe pre-development purposes. Um, and so if that does exist, that's uh, something we can dig up and look for. Uh, if it doesn't, then we can start collecting that data from, from the beginning. Uh, and a lot of these springs are interbedded with these surface streams, and so there's, there's back and forth flow, um, gaining and losing sections of streams. And some studies have been done through the hill country on, on those sorts of um, <clears throat> sections, and uh, that data may be available through different agencies as well. Ultimately, the groundwater districts in Texas, they are there to conserve, preserve, and protect the groundwater. And that's where our spring flows, of course, originate from. Uh, we do that through permitting uh, for, for wells. We, we do exempt some wells. So uh, these, these permitting mechanisms we have uh, are based on um, some sort of desired future condition. That can be a spring flow. If we want that desire for spring flow to continue, that's something that we can manage towards. Uh, it's not something that we have to do, though. So it, it, it's something that needs to be brought to the table that everybody understands we all want to do this together. And I think that's a great starting point uh, to approach your groundwater district. Make sure that they're on the same page as you approach that board member that's in your precinct and say, hey, we, we want these springs to have meaning. We want them to continue flowing. How do we do that? And we can get that conversation rolling there. Yeah, and I mean, I remember you had also mentioned that oftentimes landowners have data that's really important to share. So do you want to just mention a little bit about that? Yeah, landowners have most of the time anecdotal data, which I think is very valuable. Um, they may know when, it, when the springs went dry in previous droughts in the 1950s or, or even further back, uh, which is vital data that doesn't exist otherwise. Uh, even if it's anecdotal, I think it's helpful, especially if it's in an area that's high growth. If you have well fields going in and all of a sudden there's a, a sudden change, I think that data point is, is valuable to know. So any type of data that the landowner has, I think the district is obviously wanting to have that data available to them. And we try to work with these, dis with these landowners to establish those working relations and, you know, it's not, it's not so scary. We're not knocking on people's doors saying, hey, we're here from the government. We're here to help. Uh, we try not to do that approach. Uh, but uh, we're, we're here to conserve the water as best we can and work with those landowners. And, and if, you, if you have a spring, you know, the, as you said, the anecdotal data is, is valuable. I mean, maybe you have a spring journal where you, you keep notes of what's going on with the spring with observations. Um, I, I teach a course on, on groundwater resources at Texas State, and I, I'll take the class out on a walking tour of campus because there's a lot of kind of neat things on campus related to groundwater, and, and uh, including a, um, a flowing artesian well that was drilled in like the 1880s. And, and so we'll go and we'll measure the temperature. And the, the first time I did this, you know, one of the students goes, what are you measuring the temperature with? Because that doesn't look real scientific. And I said, well, I use this to measure temperature in my brisket, <laughs> so, which is true. Um, is this the genesis of your brisket like, analogy? <laughs> no. To, okay. Uh, Robert has a lot of analogies but, to water issues. But, but the point, point I make, well, you know, one, it's like the, the official scientific one is kind of bigger, more awkward to use, but it's like you don't need super fancy equipment to get some measurements. You know, you can use stuff that you have around the household, make a measurement taking um, photos or maybe trying to make an estimate of the flow, even qualitatively, and that could be very helpful. And measuring temperature over time can tell um, the groundwater district and hydrogeologists something about 
a little bit about the flow system. If the temperatures are real constant, that t tells us one thing versus if they change over the season. So yeah, keeping good notes and, and sharing that information is, is, is helpful. There's also, uh, I also brought my total dissolved solids. I'm a coffee snob, and so I have a, TD, a consumer TDS meter. And so that's measuring how much uh, minerals are dissolved in the water. And you can get one of those very affordably and use that in your spring to measure, again, how that's changing over time, how it's changing during droughts and wet spells. So you don't need anything fancy, just like your kitchen appliances. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. And I, I just wanted to point out that groundwater is managed locally, as we were saying. Uh, but groundwater districts are not required by state law to protect spring flow. They have the authority to do that, but there's not a mandate. You know, David was saying we need mandates to manage groundwater sustainably, and I obviously agree with that. But it, that means it's up to us. It's up to the community to make sure that their elected representatives on the groundwater district are aware of what's going on and what, you know, how they would like to see things managed. It's up to landowners and the community to be a partner in, in kind of the collection of that data and sort of the ultimate goals that you have for related to spring flow. So we, okay, so how to save a spring. The first step, engage with your local groundwater conservation district. You want to, you know, make sure that they're aware that you're out there, aware what, that you're concerned, that you're exchanging data. And you also want to find out what the groundwater district knows or doesn't know about groundwater or surface water interaction in your area. And so this is kind of relates to the next point, which is that you have to have good science to understand the connection between groundwater and surface water. That was integral to the ability for the Hayes Trinity Groundwater District to delineate the spring shed for Jacob's Well, and then to be able to adopt a management zone with policy in place um, that will hopefully, um, when it's been able to be implemented, hopefully will result in actual protections. But that science is the first step, and it doesn't exist in many locations. So I want to talk a little bit about what kind of science are we talking about here? What do we need to know what kind of, in order to be able um, to manage groundwater to protect spring flow? You, you guys, one of y'all go. <laughs> Yeah, you mean you mean more than kitchen appliances? Yeah, more uh, than kitchen appliances. Uh, well, first of all, you need to know uh, what aquifer we're even talking about. Where does spring flow come from? Which aquifer? You got to understand the boundaries of the spring shed, where the water is originating from, what areas it goes through, and then ultimately where it ends up. And uh, you you, you got to collect some well information to to get to that point where the springs come out, uh, which is what most groundwater districts are doing already, but it helps even more to get that landowner interaction to get access to those sites. But um, we've been collecting data on, on several springs in the county, including Krause Springs, which I think we'll talk about here shortly. But yeah, do you want to, why don't you go ahead and talk about what y'all are doing related to Krause yeah, Springs? Sure. Uh, Krause Springs, for those that don't know, is a spring complex in Spicewood, Texas, in its association with Little Cypress Creek. And uh, it's, it's something that the district has taken a, a proactive approach to, where we've identified that we've got these springs that come out. They're, they're on a private property, but there's a park there that you can go and enjoy them. Uh, but it's in an area that otherwise is a groundwater desert. You can more likely drill a dry well than you can a wet well in this area. But yet, you have springs that come out of the ground and have continued to flow this summer, they're continuing to flow right now. And so we started with the question, well, where's that water coming from? Uh, we started with a hypothesis that it was upwelling from a deeper aquifer. Uh, we actually proved that wrong. We did some geophysics with the USGS to identify uh, structures beneath the ground there and identify that there's some shale layers that prevent that water from coming up. So we partnered then with the Meadows Center and uh, Doug Weirman and Jenna Walker, who's here, uh, they have done work also on Jacob's Well and other areas uh, throughout the hill country to study spring flow interactions with creeks and rivers. And we've, we've been collecting data on uh, surrounding wells and flow data in Little Cypress Creek 
to understand the flow paths of that water, where it originates from, and ultimately the objective, of course, would be to protect it. And I think this is a unique situation because the groundwater district is taking the proactive approach to do the science to get ahead of any potential problems. Whereas other scenarios, you identify you have a problem, how do we then treat that problem? So hopefully we get ahead of it to where we always have spring flow in this case. And I, and I think that's, that's great and that's important, getting ahead of it because, you know, once if you don't get ahead of it, then you have a problem which is usually related to production. You know, folks have invested wells, maybe it's a public water supply well, and then it's, it's having impacts on the spring. Um, the, the story isn't over there necessarily, though. Um, the uh, groundwater management zone for Jacob's well is an example of, of uh, the pumping getting a little bit ahead of the management of the system, but the Hayes Trinity Groundwater Conservation District called it a neat process of of getting different scientists together in a science committee to study, you know, what's the spring shed, where's the water coming from, how is pumping impacting, how much of an impact, how much might pumping have to be reduced to, to get year-round spring flow back to Jacob's well. And then that fed into a stakeholder committee that the, the district facilitated and ultimately led to this um, establishment of a groundwater management zone and uh, that's still in process in the district to um, fully activate that. And there's discussions on trying to move some of the pumping that's in the spring shed out of the spring shed to preserve spring flow. So, so it's, it's you know super kudos this pump for you know getting ahead of it. Um, but uh, but don't be despondent if you're not ahead of it. There's there's methodologies to. Um, you know, try to protect spring flows. A, a combination of the science and the policy. Yeah, and um, Robert and I also have been involved over the last few years on um, the development of an integrated groundwater surface water model for the Blanco River watershed, which will enable um, the Hayes Trinity District and the Barton Springs District to, to understand how groundwater pumping is impacting springs um, and base flow and the Blanco River. And I bring this example up because it's a tool that's going to be very useful for um, both these districts to understand how to protect spring flow, but you know it it didn't exist a few years ago, and it really took um, the community the landowners um, saying, and the districts too, saying we don't have the tool that we need to be able to um, to an to analyze this, and so we raised money to to build this tool, and it really was kind of a ground up effort. So. Science is obviously number one to be able to develop policy and solutions. Um, but if you don't have the money for it, uh, and I know Mitchell has done some creative things like using the American Rescue Plan Act funding um, that went to Burnett County to help fund some of the, the work that they're doing, you, you have to work together to figure out how you're going to fund it. If it's just money that's stopping it, I always feel like you can figure that one out. That's not a hard thing to do. You can you can raise the money. It may take a while, but you can. So, um, And that's exactly what's happened with the Bratwurst model and ultimately Hayes County. I, I use the acronym without actually saying. It's called the Bratwurst model. Robert, do you want to say what that stands for? Yeah, it's the Blanco River Aquifer Assessment Tool for Water and Understanding Resiliency and Sustainability <laughs> Trends. Robert uh, named it after, you know, so we could call it so, the Bratwurst model. So, so the, I got a call from the county, and it said, uh, yeah. if you could add beer to that, we'll, we'll throw some money in. Yeah. And I said, okay, for the betterment of ecological and environmental resources. <laughs> so. we, we wrote a grant request to the uh, Bureau, of uh, Bureau of Reclamation's Water Smart grant, and I just thought it was hilarious seeing Bratwurst, like, all over <laughs> that grant application. <laughs> Um, okay, so we kind of touched on it, but the final, um, the final point is to galvanize your community around shared values and solutions. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the solutions. Uh, so you know, you, you've got an activated community, and hopefully an activated groundwater district. You, you have figured out what the science is that you need. What are some of the solutions that communities can think about? And I know that you're already thinking about those in yours, Mitchell. 
Yeah, sure. We're, we're doing that right now, uh, going through the list of options that are available to uh, preserve that spring flow and, and looking at what others have already done in the past. Uh, this management zone idea has mm -hmm. been floated around already today. Uh, that is, that's just a way that a district, instead of having district-wide rules that apply to everybody, you identify an area based on hydrogeology and say, well, we want different rules here. And here's why, because we want spring flow, in this case, to continue to flow. So we're going to have different spacing or different production uh, levels that you can get for this particular area with this one objective in mind. And, and the other areas outside of that can have different rules because the hydrogeology is different. Um, that's, a, that's a rules approach. Uh, that's, that's something that we're exploring, but I think it's, it can vary uh, depending on how big your spring shed is, you know, what, what, what your ultimate goal is looking, looking to do. Uh, if it's a smaller area, which I think Krause Springs is a smaller area, it may lead more towards uh, conservation easements that could help protect that area. Uh, and something that we haven't talked about is um, just impervious cover as, as another uh, piece of the puzzle to, it's not production, but it, it's preventing recharge from occurring into the aquifer. And those could be handled through some sort of conservation easement. Um, and you have to get the, the, all the players involved as well, including the counties and the cities that would be approving developments and or um, commercial or industrial uh, complexes in these areas that they need to be aware of what, what these goals are to establish um, this spring flow protection. Yeah, I mean, ultimately though too, it's about reducing groundwater pumping or keeping, you know, making sure that not any more groundwater pumping is going to take place in the spring shed. Can you just briefly talk about what y'all are doing in terms of the um, lot sizes. I think this would be really interesting for this audience to hear and it, it does relate to groundwater pumping and um, it may not be in the spring shed, but I, I thought it would be interesting to yeah, kind of I mean, hear about uh, it. Groundwater districts, they have t some tools in their toolbox as to how they want to manage and they can pick and choose which ones those, those are. Uh, spacing is a very valuable tool that groundwater districts can use. That can be spacing between wells. It can be spacing off the property line. They can be track size minimums to drill wells. Many areas in the hill country have established um, larger and larger tr minimum track sizes to drill a well on a newly divided tract. Um, the other aspect would be water rights. Um, I know our district and, and many others require you to have, in order to pump a lot of water, you have to have a lot of land to support that permit. And that is another type of spacing tool that I think would, it creates a buffer between you and the, the neighboring wells. And then it, it, quite frankly, it just prevents somebody from pumping a lot of water without owning or controlling a lot of the land. Okay, thank you. Robert, do you have any thoughts on solutions? Um, well, I, I, I really like the kind of correlating how much you can pump to the amount of, of land. One of the issues that, that most groundwater conservation districts have in the state is they don't really have a way to cap pumping. And, and there's also a, what I call kind of a groundwater production trap that, that if the rules don't envision a big, you know, someone big coming in getting a big permit, then more people come and they have to keep raising the cap to make room because they're afraid of getting sued. And so this tying amount, how much you can pump to how much property you have, the technical terms of correlative right, seems to me you know, one of the few tools that are out there that a district could employ. And, uh, and so um, we're, we're looking at trying to do something like that out in the middle Pecos Groundwater Conservation District in Fort Stockton. Um, there's some challenges to doing that in the hill country because if you want to preserve spring flow and you see how much you can pump to preserve spring, spring flow and you divide that out amongst all the property, ain't a whole lot of water um, left over. Um, but uh, at some point, I hope at the Meadow Center we can look at that um, and um, see what that looks like, at least for districts in the hill country, to help inform their decisions how to do that going forward. Yeah, and I think that's why it's so important to know like, as you said, where's the water coming from? Because then you can sort of tailor your solutions and strategies around that. Because, you know, maybe it is that a conservation easement 
or a springshed easement maybe is another way to think about it, is the better tool for um, your community because you can't go back and change all of the existing rules and the way the district is allocating groundwater. And, and if you have a correlative right, um, you can conserve groundwater that way. Either you're a landowner and you decide you're not mm -hmm. going to produce or sell your water and so it stays in the aquifer, or a third party can come and buy and retire those rights for the preservation of spring flow. Yeah. Well, do we want to take questions now? How much time do we have before? Okay, so we'll take some questions and then we'll just save like three minutes to play the video. Okay, so that was two questions. Um, I'll, let me do the first one, and I might have to ask you to repeat the second. But the first one is, you know, we have this um, antiquated uh, tort law, the rule of capture, which says that basically a landowner can pump as much groundwater as they want, even if it, uh, even if it negatively impacts their neighbor. And so how does that impact spring flow? I mean, I'll let you all weigh in, but where we have groundwater conservation districts, then the rule of capture is pretty much irrelevant. So um, some of these tools that Mitchell mentioned are the way that you would address that, but would you guys like to weigh in? Yeah, if you're in a GCD, then the rule of capture does not apply. If you're outside of a GCD, then it absolutely does apply and, and could impact spring flows tremendously. Um, therefore, you could set up some sort of conservation easements to to work within those realms, but you lose the ability to do groundwater district rules and permitting. Yeah, can I, sorry, just a nuance to that though is that, you know, groundwater is privately owned in Texas and sometimes it's that private ownership mentality, I think, that makes it difficult for groundwater districts to know to what extent they can regulate groundwater before, you know, they're going to get hit from a, with a lawsuit. That's, I think, more challenging than the rule of capture, is overcoming that and trying to think about, well, how can we change that narrative and start to think about groundwater districts existing to protect private property, um, to protect that privately owned groundwater. And managing groundwater sustainably, managing groundwater to protect spring flow is one way to do that. Um, and so are these incentives, like more incentive-based solutions like conservation easements. I just just to build on that, there's a lot of talk about, you know, because rule of capture, the whole private property aspect of the rule of capture still applies underneath groundwater districts. But I've been doing a lot of work on groundwater sustainability, and you really don't have a private property right if you're not managing sustainably because your neighbor can suck the water out from underneath your property. If groundwater is managed sustainably, it doesn't matter if you're using it today, tomorrow, 10 years from now, whenever you decide to use it, it's going to be there because it's being managed in a way that'll be there forever. Um, and, so, and, so, and so there's a lot of districts that aren't um, managing. They have the ability to, but they're not managing towards preserving spring flow or surface water flow. And so, so part of it's changing the mindset of what's important when you produce from, from an aquifer. Um, instead of maximizing production, maybe for economic reasons, you know, maybe you should also be looking at um, preserving surface water flow, preserving springs. Yeah, Chapter 36 of the Water Code, the districts are required to balance the needs for conservation with the needs for development. And which way do you want that to swing? That's what you need to approach your board members with, and hopefully they lead lean towards the, the conservation end, but it's not always the case um, because of this private property issue that we've already discussed. So, I, okay, we'll circle back to that question. I'm wondering if there's any place besides San Antonio in Texas where aquifer storage and recovery is being used to support drought spring flow. And the, the reason for the question is obviously 
average doesn't mean anything to our rainfall in Texas, even before climate change. It, we either get tons or very little, but, but if we get more tons spread further apart, then saving some of it in another aquifer might help. So, yeah, so aquifer storage and recovery is taking water from a different source and storing it underground and then pulling it back out. And, uh, and the project um, that Carol's referring to that San Antonio Water System has um, is taking excess Edwards water underneath permits and storing it in the Carrizo Aquifer in southern Bear County. Part of that's done for San Antonio's benefit, but then also the Edwards Aquifer Authority has purchased water and space, if you will, to store water to protect spring flows. There's no other place in Texas doing it for springs. You know, Kerrville has an aquifer storage and recovery project. Um, El Paso has one with treated wastewater. Kerrville's is with treated surface water. And, and there's, there's several communities along the um, I-35 corridor that uh, are looking at doing it. And actually, I think there's a small water supplier that's doing it. I'm also City not aware. City of Austin. Of, yeah, City of Austin's looking at doing, doing it. Um, there's, uh, um, I'm not aware of even any other ASR in, this, in the country that's doing it specifically for spring, spring flow. But the way that works there is that um, that water will go to San Antonio, and so instead of San Antonio pumping Edwards water, it'll take water from stored water from the Carrizo, and that will keep spring levels up during repeats of the drought of record to protect spring flow and the endangered species. So, I think also what you might be asking, or just another part of that, is just managed aquifer um, with recharge. Recharge. <laughs> Where's the word? Um, which is not really injecting it underground with the well and pulling it back out, but just managing the landscape in a way that's going to help um, recharge water more quickly. And there, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, and so I could see that being a way that might work better than an ASR facility if you're thinking about wanting to basically enhance recharge that so will ultimately come out through a spring. But. We have time for one more question. Okay, great. Um, Robert, thank you. Vanessa, great panel. I oh, have Christy a kind of a... Either. This is Christy. Oh. I couldn't find like, you. Yeah, I was like, either. where is she? I'm back here. <laughs> okay. This is a big picture question. And we have this one kind of super groundwater conservation districts in, in the Edwards Aquifer Authority that actually has a cap and is managing the Edwards sustainably. I just want to put the idea out and hear your thoughts, like pros, cons. Should we begin to be advocating for a Trinity Aquifer Authority where we truly do cap it, give those districts the ability to say no, and manage it sustainably? <laughs> I mean, I... I have always felt that we need a cap for the Trinity Aquifer. I mean, the, and the Trinity and the Edwards are connected, too. It's not like they're completely separate either. Um, I, I, where I am not so certain, so certain, I agree, is having some massive groundwater district. It, it cuts both ways. I mean, I think being able to go and talk to Charlie and Mitchell and have your friends run for board positions... Is, is how you get your voice heard. Um, but the problem is that districts don't have enough money and enough resources. So, it, I mean, that's one thing that we're working on at EDF is to try to get the state to provide more funding for some of these resources, like especially for data and science needs. But um, if we can tackle that, you know, then that's kind of what I would prefer over sort of a more regional approach. Um, but I still think that you can have a cap and something that the districts, um, you know, help to achieve that sustainability goal um, without having that a big district. I don't know. If, if hydrogeologists ran the world, um, you know, it, it probably would be over an aquifer-based system. Um, but we do have the system that we have. And, and you could argue that the groundwater management area um, approach tries to... Um, regionalize those decisions and regionalize some of the management. So, so if you're not familiar, you know, we have 100 groundwater conservation districts across the state, but there's groundwater management areas over chunks of the aquifer, and then they get together and collectively decide what their desired future conditions are, what their management goals are. And so 
Um, so that, to a certain degree, that, that, that gets you there. It's not as, uh, you know, again, if hydrogeologists ruled the world, which probably, thank God, we don't, but <laughs> it would look very different. <laughs> yeah, I guess you could always find an endangered species, and then we can start that going. So. <laughs> okay. Thanks, thanks so much to our panel. Thank you. Let's yeah. give them another round thank of applause. You.